Hello, this is Ron Sipsik. This is the first part of a three-part series on cost behavior. In this particular segment, we're going to take a look at long-run choices. Before we dive into the whole realm of cost and why cost is important, it's very important to take a look at this most basic formula, which explains business behavior. Total revenue minus total cost equals total profit. Notice that if a firm's revenue increases, dollar sales increases, but its costs decrease, this could be and or, revenues could go up, costs could stay constant, costs could go down, revenue could stay constant, or revenues could go up and costs could go, go down, we could say that total profits will increase. On the other hand, let me change the color here, if revenues fall and costs increase, or revenues fall, or costs increases, then profits are going to fall. So the point is, cost is a key determinant. Cost is a key determinant of profit outcomes. Now, I think it's very helpful at this point to say something about the word profit. Profit is simply the return to the owners, to the entrepreneurs. And just like labor, they must be paid. Entrepreneurs must be paid if they're going to do what they do to start businesses and sustain businesses and make the effort they make to organize and promote the long-term welfare of a particular business. Notice that the entrepreneur is rewarded by keeping costs as low as possible because that improves the so-called bottom line. If we take a look here, we can think that we can we can think of total cost really as the stewardship, as a measure of the stewardship of resources in a world of scarcity. So we know that we live in a world of scarcity. We know that resources are scarce. Companies that do a good job of using as few resources as possible to achieve their goals are going to find that they keep their costs low. So High stewardship, we can build a little model here. High stewardship or good stewardship, which is using few resources, leads to lower cost. Lower cost leads to higher profit. So high profit is actually a reward for good stewardship. Companies that do a good job of stewarding their resources keep their costs lower and are rewarded with higher profits. Now there's a lot of, lot of talk out there about profits and some people think that profits are a dirty word. But keep in mind that profits are the residual. Profits are what you get after you've used up scarce resources. And wasteful companies will find that their costs are higher. Everything else held constant and their profits are lower. So sometimes high profits are not a sign of somebody doing something bad. In fact, most of the time they're not a sign of someone doing something bad. In fact, most of the time they're a sign of somebody doing something good. That is, selling something that is socially valuable, keeping resource costs to a minimum, and therefore profiting. So if we look at this formula again, we see that revenue is the sign that we're selling something that is socially valuable. Cost is a sign of how much we're, how much of the world's scarce resources we're using. Profit is the residual. So if I make something that is socially very valuable, what will I have? I'll have high revenues. If I don't use a lot of resources to make it, relatively speaking, I'll have low costs. My reward for making something that is socially valuable and not wasting a lot of resources to make it is I'm rewarded with high profits. On the other hand, if I'm wasteful with the world's resources, my costs will be higher. If I'm making things that are socially, well, that aren't very socially valuable, that consumers don't consider very valuable, my revenues will be low, and my reward for that will be I'll incur losses. And in a competitive world, your reward for losses is you go out of business. And that's exactly what we want in a capitalistic system. We want businesses to go out of business who are making things that are not very socially valuable and incurring high costs to do it. All right, so 
This equation, again, is a key in understanding the behavior of the firm, and we see that cost is going to be a key determinant of this, so we want to take a close look at cost. Now, our focus in this particular lesson will be on the long run. So let's define the long run. The long run is a period of time, period of time, sufficient for, whoop, sorry about that, for all inputs to, ch to be changed. So in the long run, everything can be changed, all of the firm's inputs. This is a focus on inputs, what the firm uses to produce output. So in our case, the particular example we're going to do today, we're going to only have two inputs, workers and machines. So in the long run, the firm can vary workers and vary the number of machines. Everything can be changed to alter the output rate. In the short run, it's not that simple. In the short run, we have a period of time when certain inputs are fixed. So it may take us three months to order a machine, get it up and running, and get it producing widgets. We produce widgets, let's say. Two weeks is not sufficient for us to get a new machine in. So two weeks might be enough time for us to hire an additional worker or to restaff. You know, maybe we have somebody on uh, staff who we can reschedule to work or not work. So we can change the number of workers employed maybe daily, hourly even. But we cannot change the number of machines employed daily or hourly. You go, well, we can always shut a machine off. We can, but we still have to pay for it. So. If we, if we need more machines, it'll take us, let's say in this example, three months to get them. If we want to get rid of machines that we have because we're not using them, it might take us three months to get rid of them. So we can see in this particular example, if we use the three-month example, that any time period less than three months is short run. Any time period three months or longer is long run. Okay, and we'll talk more about this as we move forward. Now, our... Our focus in this particular lesson will be long-run cost choices. So that's what we're going to take a look at. Now, it's important to understand that every business decision fundamentally start, has to start with some sort of output goal. We have to know what we're making, and we have to have some idea for how, of, of how much we want to make. So we'll say in this particular example that the firm's output goal is 40 widgets and let's say this is 40 widgets per day so this firm is going to try to produce 40 widgets per day if you don't know what a widget is you need to look this up in the dictionary okay this is your homework assignment okay now how do you produce 40 widgets per day well we'll assume that if this company is going to try to do that that they know how to do that okay and the company tells us that if you take the number of workers, multiply it by the number of machines, and set that equal to, to 64, you go, why 64? Because the firm told us that that's how you have to do it. How, did the, how does the firm know this? Well, they've learned this somehow. Either someone has told them that this works, or they have, through experience, discovered that this works. Either way, they have what is called a production function. So what is a production function? It's a formula. In this case, it's an equation. And what does this formula tell us? It shows how the inputs must be combined to achieve a given output goal. So the output goal in this case is 40. Notice it's not 64. 64 is just an, uh, a coefficient in the equation. 40 is what we're trying to produce daily. Now, if we look at this equation, we can see that there's more than one combination of inputs that can fit it. You have two unknowns, 
and you have one, one equation. So there's actually an infinite number of solutions to this equation. Now, we don't have enough time to lay out an infinite number of possible solutions. In fact, that would take an infinite quantity of time. So let's not bother. Let's set up a little table here, and let's look at five possible combinations. So here's quantity, 40, 40, 40. Scroll down a little bit here. 40, 40. Let's put workers here. We'll abbreviate workers with a W. So one worker, four workers, eight workers, 16, 64. If we plug those numbers into our equation, I'm going to get, leave, leave yourself a little room here. You'll see why. One worker, 64 machines would fit the equation. Four workers, 16 machines would fit the equation. Eight workers, eight machines would fit the equation. 16, 4, and 64, 1. All of these combinations would fit the equation. Yay. So these solutions are what we call technically efficient solutions. Why? They fit the production function. And they do more than that. I'll tell you in a minute what they do. Now, you can see that we've missed a few combinations. In fact, we've missed actually an infinite number of combinations. We, we know we've missed 232 and 32, too. Those are obvious. But there's all sorts of fractional combinations that would work here. You can hire one and a half workers, one and a quarter workers, because you can have full-time workers and part-time workers. You could hire big machines, little machines, and machines in between. So there's different combinations here that haven't been specified. So this, this, really that function accommodates an infinite number of combinations. We've identified five paths to the output goal. Okay? Now, which of these five paths should we choose? That becomes the ultimate question in this lesson. But before I answer that, let me just point out something. What would happen if we used more inputs than necessary? Could we achieve the goal with, let's say, two workers and 64 machines? The answer is yes. If we can achieve the goal with one worker and 64 machines, we can most certainly achieve the goal with two workers and 64 machines. Can we achieve the goal with 10 workers and 10 machines? Yes. How do I know that? Because we can achieve the goal with eight workers in eight machines. So having more resources than are specified here would allow us to achieve the goal. These are feasible options. The problem is they're not efficient. So there are an infinite number of efficient solutions, but there's also an infinite number of solutions that would allow us to achieve the goal that are not efficient. These represent cases where we're using too many resources. So technical efficiency, yes, these are combinations that fit the production function, but they also represent the case where we're using the fewest resources possible to achieve the goal. fewest resources possible to achieve the goal. 8, 8 is, represents the fewest resources possible. 10, 10 does not. 164 represents the fewest resources possible with one worker to achieve the goal. Two workers and 64 machines is not the fewest. Okay, so combinations above these combinations are inefficient. They're feasible but inefficient. Now the other side of it, let's look at that quickly before we finish the problem. Could we achieve the goal with zero workers in 64 machines? The production function says no, not feasible. Zero times 64 is not 64. So apparently it takes at least one worker to get this thing going. You need at least one worker to turn the machines on apparently. You don't have machines turning machines on. So you need at least one worker and 64, and, and if you use one worker, you're going to use 64 machines to achieve the goal. What about five workers and five machines? Well, certainly lower cost, but not feasible. 
because you need at least eight workers and eight machines to achieve the goal. All right, so combinations representing fewer resources than those stated are, yeah, they're more efficient, but they're not feasible. Okay, so you have to have a combination that fits the production function to be both feasible and efficient. These are feasible. In fact, let's make a little note of that. These are feasible and efficient. Feasible and efficient. Other combinations are either going to lack feasibility or lack efficiency. Now, we have five possible paths to the goal. The question arises, which path should we choose? The answer is, we don't know. We need more information. Let's say that the wage paid to a worker is $56 per day. Let's say the payment for a mach machine, for machinery, payment for machinery, which technically is called interest in economics. The payment to capital is called interest. The interest payment on this for this machine, let's say, is $24 per day. So these are per day rates. Remember that uh, you know, economic terms. The terms we use in an economics course may be different than how that term is used outside of economics. Uh, but this, this term interest really does connect with the meaning. If we buy that machine, we will have had to save. Okay, we're either going to have to save ourselves or borrow someone else's saving. So, in essence, the payment for the use of that machine is the foregone interest we could have earned on that on that what was saved. So we either took the money out of our own account and put it into this machine, and in fact that money could have earned interest if we had left it in the account, or we're borrowing money from someone and we have to pay for the use of that money. And so in a sense, uh, it, it's, it's technically correct to call the payment for capital interest. All right. Now don't let that shake you up. If that bothers you, uh, that's not really a deal breaker. Okay, now how do we calculate the total cost of each of these options? Let's wrap this lesson up. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to multiply these quantities by their dollar rates. So 1 times what? 1 times 56, 4 times 56, 8 times 56, 16 times 56, 64 times 56 plus 64 times what? 24. 60, 16 times 24. 8 times 24. 4 times 24. 1 times 24. So these are all dollar amounts. And if we do these calculations, we get the total cost of each combination. I just happen to have those. This first combination, 1592. Second com combination, 608. These first two combinations are equally efficient based on the production function from a technical standpoint. However, the second option is much cheaper. It's less than half. Go to the third option, 640. Fourth option, 992. Fifth option, 3608. So of these five options, Clearly, using four workers and 16 machines is the cheapest way to attain the goal. This has a name. This is the economically, economically, economically efficient solution. Let me write that down below where you can read it. So what is the economically efficient solution. That's producing the goal, the output goal, at what? At the lowest possible cost. Stewardship being a good steward. When you find this solution, you're more likely to survive in a world of competition because others are looking for this same solution. And 
you're socially producing, you're producing in a socially sensitive way. You're using as few resources. You're not wasting resources. You're not wasting labor. You're not wasting machinery in a world of scarcity. You know, how can you waste labor? Well, using labor you don't really need is wasting labor. That labor could be used for something else. That could produce something that is really needed. Okay? You go, well, well I, I really, my goal in life is to have a job where I'm not really needed, where I'm paid, but I, I don't really have to perform. Well, workers who are getting paid and who aren't performing, who aren't working, aren't producing. If they're not producing, they're not adding to output, they're being wasted. Maybe they are wasted. Um, but the point is, we're not getting as much output from the resource base as we possibly could. That's inefficient. And in a world of scarcity, we will be poorer as a result of that. Our life, our life, the quality of life will be lower as a result of that. So we get the pie is biggest, and the quality of the pie is biggest usually when everybody's working, everyone who can work is working, and they're being used optimally. They're being used at something that they're productive at. Okay? You, know, you say, I disagree with that. Well, that's fine, but this is how the world works out there. Companies are looking for workers who are productive. Now, let me draw this and illustrate this with a graph. All right? So let's put workers on this axis. And let's put machinery, machines on this axis, and let's draw a function, a line that looks like this. This is called, in more advanced courses, this is called an isoquant. In more advanced economic studies, this is the kind of material you learn in a principles course. But in more advanced courses, intermediate and advanced uh, microeconomic courses, you're going to come across the term isoquant. But what an isoquant is, is it's a line where every point on this represents the same level of production, 40. 40. 40. So each of these points, the quantity is 40. But you can see that at each of these points, the number of inputs is different. So this is a graph of the table we just put up there. Let me use a different color here. So if we use 16 workers, we don't need more than what? Four machines. If we use eight workers, we are going to need eight machines. So if you want to use fewer workers, you've got to use more machines. And if this is four workers, we want to get by with four workers, we're going to even need more machines. Notice this is not linear. It's not one for one. This, this, line, is not, this line is not a straight line. It's a curve. So each of these points represent a production, uh, a combination of inputs that lead to the same level of production. And that's what our table showed. Now, we know, because we just solved the problem, which combination is optimal? And it's not the one right in the middle. It's not the 8-8 combination, though that's attractive. It looks good. It's actually this one. So this turns out to be the economically efficient solution. Notice every point on this line is technically efficient. So let me, um, let me note that. Every point, all the red points, are technically efficient. They're all technically efficient. And you can see there's an infinite number of them. We only identified three here, five above. But there's only one point on the line that is economically efficient. And you can actually think of points out here. Well, let me use a different color. Out here, let's look at this point. Look at this point right here. At this point, what are we using? We're using 16 machines, but we're using what? Eight workers. Well, this is this is feasible, but not what? But not efficient. So every point to the right of the isoquant represents a point that is feasible, but not efficient. 
And then what's wrong? Let me find a different color here. Let me go with green. What's pr the problem with this point? What's the problem with that point? Well, that's four workers and eight machines. That's what? That's not feasible. It's not feasible. Yes, it's more efficient. If we could, if we could hit the goal with four workers and eight machines, that's that's wonderful. But we can't. It's not feasible with present technology, present inputs. Okay. So moral of the story: if we're on the isoquant, we're operating what? Technically efficient. Not every solution on the isoquant is economically efficient. Only one solution is economically efficient. If I'm to the right of the isoquant, I can achieve the goal, but I'm not being efficient. If I'm inside the isoquant, it's not feasible. I mean, it's very efficient, but it's not feasible. All right, we'll be talking more about these concepts in, in parts two and three.